I do not know of a greater calling in all the world than the call of God to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. To preach His Word. And I've been preaching it now for over 60 years, and let me just tell you something. I wrote a message years ago that I was going to preach in the church that I pastored. And the message simply was in reference to uh, Mount Calvary or even the mountains in the Bible. I'm going to read to you a scripture here. And let me first of all show you. I had the message that I had prepared years ago written right here. And there's all the pages handwritten of the message that I had written to preach. And I have yet to be able to preach it. But I'm going to. And you're going to be the first ones to hear it. And I hope that it'll be as much of a blessing to you to hear it as it was for me to write it and to prepare it. Let me give you a verse. And that's simply found in Genesis chapter number 22. And then I'll give you other verses throughout the message. But listen to Genesis chapter 2. And that, of course, is the great chapter where, you know, that Abraham offered Isaac. And I'll not go into all of that, but it was just an awesome thought that I had when I uh, prepared this message and came across this phrase. Here it is. Now get the scene. Abraham as a type of God offering his son, Isaac, who's a type of Christ. But here's the thing that caught my eye. Now, if you've ever listened to a message, it'll not be a great message maybe to you as much as, much as it was for me to think about this and then pin it down. But listen to what Abraham said as God performed the miracle of providing for him the lamb to be sacrificed instead of his son. I read this verse in verse number 14 of Genesis 22, and it says, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in other words, Jehovah Jireh means today. Here's, the, here's what he said. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. And I want to explain to you what God gave to me in, in, in many different areas, how the Lord revealed this to me. But listen to this. And by the way, the first time you'll ever read about a mountain in the Bible is not there. You read about the mountain in the book of Genesis again, but it's in chapter number 7, verse number 20. And that mountain is where Noah and the ark that started the whole new creation of the world landed after the flood. And you find that mountain and, and the use of the word mountain in Genesis chapter 7 and verse number 20. Now hear me. The crucifixion of Christ was on Mount Calvary. For that reason, and above and beyond all mountains, stands Calvary. And not only that, but that's the reason why we have what Abraham said in my text, of, of Genesis chapter 22 and verse number, uh, let me turn to it here, Genesis chapter 22, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. <laughs> That's Calvary. That's what he's talking about. This is where the Son was offered by the Father. And that's why he said, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now listen to me on purpose. There are many mountains that are mentioned in the Bible. Many. In fact, I want to show you a few of them. Here's they are. Listen to this. There's Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was the great vision robed in clouds, shrouded in smoke, 
illuminated with fire, with earthquakes and thunders and sounding throughout its gorges, lightnings blazing in zigzag form across the dark clouds. With this scene on this mount, the dreaded law of thou shalt nots was given on Mount Sinai. Commandments were written by the very finger of God with the same measure of authority as they have today. On Mount Sinai, that great mountain, God gave the law, and you can read it and read about it. You can read it in the Old Testament and read about its meanings of the law in the New Testament. Then, what other mountain do we have that makes a memory to us from the scripture? There's an old Mount Horeb. You can find this in your Bible as well. And this is where the eternal flame glowing in a bush, the glory and deity of God who defied all laws of nature. And this is where, I mean, it, it, it burned, but it was not consumed. It spoke from that, that, on this mountain, it spoke with the word of God. Here's another one. Let's not forget Mount Hor. H-O-R, where the spirit of the high priest Aaron, what a great man God put in, in that position, and the spirit of this high priest Aaron took wing and flew heavenward as he transferred his priestly robes to his son. From where? From Mount Hor. Then now listen, let's tiptoe over to the edge of Mount Pisgah. That's also in our Bible. And get the mosaic view of the promised land. There's Moses standing on the Mount Pisgah and God lets him view the land, the promised land of Israel, Canaan. And at this mountain there was flowing with milk and honey, lush, lovely, and longly anticipated mount and long lush and lovely anticipated Israel. Now, what do we find here? What mountain did you say captures your curiosity? If you were to ask, I've asked a lot of folks, you know, about do you have a special scene from the Bible that you enjoy? And a number of them have said, yes, I like what took place on Mount Carmel. Get it? Let's not forget Mount Sinai. Let's not forget Mount Hor. Let's not forget Mount Horeb. Let's not forget Mount Pisgah. And let's dead sure not forget Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel, you mean that mountain where a display of fallen fire from heaven came as a result of one man's prayer whose name was Elijah? And down came fire on that mountain out of heaven. Let's not forget the scenes that God has given to us from the mountains. Then we read about a mountain, and it's called Mount Moriah. This is where God tested his friend Abraham with the sacrifice of his only begotten son that we talked about there earlier. And oh yes, remember, there's that majestic tri-peaked Mount Hermon. Oh, I love this mountain. Is capped with snow. It's the highest mountain in Israel, and it snows and rains nearly particularly all the time on Mount Hermon. And that's the very fountainhead of the River Jordan. That's where Jordan, the River Jordan, is formed at the base of Mount Hermon. And where the Savior himself was transfigured and his countenance became whiter than the glaring snow, and that was on Mount Hermon. Think about that. Don't let these uh, kind of things just bypass your memory. Let's think about these mountains. I dare you not to forget Mount Olivet. Mount Olivet, the very place of sweet farewell as it says in the book of Acts, as Jesus ascended up off of Mount uh, Olivet, 
as the Lord made the clouds to be his chariot and the winds his steeds, and he went back to God from Mount Olivet. What a mountain! What a mountain! So far we've read nothing but greatness of these mountains. And here's what I want you to think with me about. There are a number, of, I, I have a number of places in the mountains that, that I refer to great events that took place in my own personal life. In fact, living right there in Colorado Springs where I pastored the church and I'm still, uh, still going into that church with my son pastors. And what do we have there? The greatest attraction for tourists in probably the whole state of Colorado has come to view Pikes Peak. The mountain called 14,110 feet high in the air. The beauty of Pikes Peak. And then when I was just a kid raised up on a ranch, I was on in the ranch in Montana, and the area of our ranch was in the Bull Mountains. I was raised in the mountains. And then... There's that wonderful, glorious mountain in the very city that I was saved in Deer Lodge, Montana. And there's the famous mountain in that area called Mount Powell. And I dare not ever forget the great mountain of Mount Maurice, where I was in Red Lodge, Montana, and the high school and Mount Maurice, now a big popular ski area and so forth. But it was at the bottom of Mount Maurice that I met and proposed to my wife. I don't dare forget Mount Maurice. I mean, think about it. But above all the mountains of the earth, think now, of all the mountains in the earth is the mountain where God in bloody garments dressed, he was in bloody garments and enticed us with his love. What's that mountain called? Mount Calvary. God himself named it. This is the mountain of all mountains. I'm living right now in Canyon City, Colorado. And we have all of these different mountains surrounding us everywhere. And they're beautiful. They're gorgeous. They're glamorous. But as far as God was concerned, there was no mountain greater. The songs that we sing at Calvary and all of the songs that have the reference to Calvary, that happened to be the mountain that God specifies in the Bible called Mount Calvary. And that is the mountain of all mountains. This is the place on Mount Calvary of all the earth's places. This is where Christ put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. No wonder God emphasizes as the great mountain of Mount Calvary. Christ himself was on that mountain as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. It was there where he owed the law no debt. He passed under the law of death and sin, and he did it voluntarily. He who with the power to smite his enemies with a lightning strike, elected to die on a mountain called Calvary. He had the power to have destroyed anything and everything and anyone and everyone. But he decided to die on that mountain for you and me. No wonder Calvary, Mount Calvary, became God's particular mountain. Did you know it was on this mountain called Calvary that God's eternal attributes emptied their vials of burning wrath upon the sinless sacrifice, who in agony he made the earth quake the sun hid its brilliant face in blush and shame for what was happening on Mount Calvary. He, God, on this mountain, the creator of the mist, 
the clouds, the oceans, the lakes, the rivers, the streams, the rain permitted him to thirst who came to remove the moral thirst of every one of us because of our sin. We had an unquenchable thirst. I mean, it was on this mountain that the God who clothes the fields and the God who feeds the sparrow when they cry left Jesus naked under the sky and answered him not. Oh yes, he took care of all of the sparrows, but he did not take care to prevent his son from going to that mountain, stripped naked and treated unbelievably unmerciful. Is it any wonder the heavens went black and the sun withdrew its light and the rocks rent in twain just as in astonishment that the rose of Sharon, the beautiful rose of Sharon, Jesus Christ, should meet such doom on this mountain of Mount Calvary. Is it any wonder that all the people came to see such a sight? As you read in your scripture, you find us exactly what happened. They came gazing at the things that were done. They were gazing at love incarnate who was rejected. They were gazing at love incarnate who was crucified and tortured. They were gazing at the way men treat the only one that was ever perfect on this earth. Because the Bible says, and sitting down, they watched him there. Gazing upon one of the most cruel, torturous, vile sacrifice on Mount Calvary. For who did he die? For who did God let him die such a horrible death? I'll tell you for who. You're looking at him right now. And I can point at you. And that's who. He went that torture for. And what have you done for him? What are you doing for him? What mountain of the spiritual life have you got? Do you have a mountain of prayer? Do you have a mountain of sacrifice, of giving to the Lord? Do you have a mountain of living holy to God? Where's your mountain of sacrifice? God help us. I'm telling you, Calvary says, Earth has no darker sin. History has no blacker page. Humanity has no fouler stench. The, I'm talking about then the thought that God in the hands of angry sinners, a message that was preached years ago by a great preacher where a number of great, I mean, Hundreds and maybe even thousands of people were saved when that man stood up and preached the message. God in the hands of angry sinners. Where did that take place? Where was it that God was in the hands of angry sinners? Mount Calvary. Yet, that's why he came. That's the one purpose he came. He came to die that man who was born once and born dead might be born again and born alive on Mount Calvary. It was not by his sinless life Jesus was man's substitute. Although that's a great, great truth. But that's not what it was not by his sinless life that Jesus was man's substitute. And it was not by his miracles that he honored the law, satisfied justice, and met the demands of holiness. It was not by his beautiful example that he took our place. Now listen to me. He was the prince of preachers. But it was not through his preaching that he opened a fountain for all uncleanness. 
Follow me carefully. It was not by his holy character that he repaired the insulted dignity of God's nature by repairing our nature to be like God's. Oh no. Only by his suffering the death, the punishment of sin, did he compensate God's justice and God's government of righteousness. I don't know about you, but I feel like raising my hands and saying, Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because my government is wicked. And I'm not talking about the government of the world or the, our nation or our country. I'm talking about my personal government. That I can't hardly even govern my own life because of the sin nature that I have. But thanks to God, blessed be God, that it's by His righteousness. The aim of His life was death. In death, He paid our debt. Mount Calvary, the Mount of God, the debt I owe God. Think of this. Please think of this. I owe God a debt that I can't pay. And Jesus paid a debt for me that He didn't owe. Oh, I'm telling you, Mount Calvary is the saddest story of man and it's the saddest story of God. But together, they make the saddest story of the ages. You see, the saddest story of men began in surroundings that were, were perfect. I'm talking about the Garden of Eden. Think of it. Man himself, perfectly robed in garments of righteousness, and man was drinking from a life-giving stream, eating from the fruit of the trees of the garden, breathing the breath of God Himself, and given the power of choice. And in Eden, man fell. And that began the saddest story of man. It's tragic. Color is seen in the blood of righteous Abel. Its sadness is seen in drunken Noah. Its confusion is seen in the Tower of Babel, which means confusion. Its slavery is seen in Egypt's bondage, where the Israelites were under the bondage of the Egyptians. Its sting is seen in the serpents in the wilderness as they bit people and had to be put on a, a serpent on a pole, and all they had to do was look and believe to be saved. I'm telling you, its tragedy is seen in the captivity of Babylon. In the sin of David, in the idolatry of Solomon, your sin, your deceit, think of it, in the betrayal and crucifixion of the lowly Nazarene named Jesus, took care of it all. Free, free, free. I am free of everything that Adam allowed to happen that closed the door of all perfection. Jesus opened the door to all righteousness. Where? On Mount Calvary. But you'll not know the sadness of the fall unless you fall to the bottom of the bottomless pit. And God knows, I pray you don't, because you don't have to, because of what did take place on Mount Calvary. Unless you grope in the outer darkness, unless you weep and wail in hell, where you forever experience the waves of quenchless fire. Look, if there is no fall, there is no hell, then there is no salvation to preach. But there was a fall. And you and I have the nature of the fall when we're born, even as babes at birth. We have the nature of the fall. But because of what took place on Calvary, we have now the nature of freedom from the fall. Look, if there's no fall, there's no hell. That's why I'm telling you the saddest story is man 
the saddest story of man, he fell. The saddest story of God is Calvary, where he had to give his only begotten son to die the cruel death because of the fall. Calvary originated in God's love, conceived in the counsels of eternity. A far cry it is from the Garden of Eden to Calvary. Yet they both have very intimate relations. The tragedy of one is the, is the reason for the tragedy of the other. The tragedy of Calvary is the reason for the tragedy of, I should say the tragedy of Eden is the reason for the tragedy of Calvary. In Eden is the beginning of the tragedy which leads on to Calvary. The agony of the atonement for sin on Calvary is because of the tragedy of sin in Eden. I hope you're getting this about the mountains. Calvary casts its shadow with brilliant radiance from Golgotha throughout the entire human history to the foundation of the world. And from Golgotha, the place of the skull, to Pilate's court where with the scourge his quivering flesh bore its eternal red scars for us. And on the, on the Gethsemane's garden, where the roots of the still existing olive trees were watered by his crimson tears, as he knelt and said, Father, let this cup pass from me, and the tears that would be dripping off and watering the very trees of the olive garden that produce the oil, an oil a type of the Holy Spirit. And on to the upper room. When he changed the wine of the Lord's Supper into the symbol of his forever blood. Calvary. Calvary cast its shadow onto the mountain of transfiguration where Moses and Elijah talked with him of his coming death. Calvary's shadow reached to the Jordan River where his burial and baptism spoke of his death. Calvary's shadow reached to Bethlehem where heaven hung out its brightest star to mark his very birthplace. Calvary's shadow was over the victim, whether lamb or bullock or dove as it was sacrificed on the altar of the tabernacle. Calvary's shadow was over the blood-stained doorpost and lintels of the Passover night, which foreshadowed the greatest deliverance yet to come, which took place on Calvary. Calvary's shadow was in Genesis 3.15 when God promised the seed of the woman, who never has the seed until God made the Mary have it, to overcome the seed of Satan. I'm talking about from Eden to Calvary. God had his plan and Mount Calvary was in his view. Can you imagine? Now listen to this. Jesus himself is the creator of all things. The Bible says that, Colossians and so forth. Many other. Jesus created it and he created it for himself. Well, is he God or not? Yes, he is. So when he created all these mountains and he came to create Mount Calvary, did he not know and did he not plan when he created Mount Calvary what would take place there? He knew. It was in his heart and it was in his mind and he created Mount Calvary for that very purpose. Oh, how his death was prearranged and prophesied and provided by God. This was no afterthought. You see, Jesus was born with the shadow of the cross. The shadow of the cross was continually on his life. In Bethlehem, swaddling clothes, fleeing into Egypt. It was upon the waters of Galilee, at the door of the temple, on the Gethsemane's garden, when they came with lanterns, when Judas uh, betrayed him with a kiss like an adder, then Herod mocked him, he was scourged, then the cross was not a shadow. The cross was not a shadow, it was a surety. And when God created Mount Calvary, he had that mind. 
That is not a shadow. It's a surety. That's where I will die. The cross is no shadow. It's a reality. <clears throat> and I must now preach it. Our fathers, our forefathers preached it with the rattle of chains and smoke and the martyr's stake and from dark dungeons. Why? Because it's the preacher's message to preach what took place on Mount Calvary. The message in the blood of Christ fastened with the nails of the cross. We must proclaim this cross. Preach it. Not as an academic study. Preach it. Not with soft voice, but with trumpet tones. Preach it. Not as a philosophy, but as a fact. Preach it. Not as entertainment, but for conviction. Preach it. Not as a sedative for sin, but as an urgency to warn men of the wrath of God to come if they don't believe what took place on Mount Calvary. If we do not preach the cross, our churches will be nothing but lighthouses without water. Our churches are just becoming barren fig trees and sleeping watchmen and silent trumpets and messengers without good news and a joy to the devil, but it's an offense to God because we don't preach Calvary. Oh, thank God for the cross. You see, Jesus died an initial death as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Listen to me now. He died an official death as God, as God's a selected substitute. He died as a judicial death, a judgment for others. And he died a sacrificial death, the just for the unjust. Where? On Calvary. In all this, we rejoice at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross kneel at the cross and you will find right there every need that you'd ever have including salvation i'm telling you ladies and gentlemen i'll close with this but i wrote that message about the mountains of god and i'll be honest with you it's hard for me not to reflect on the Mount Calvary as God did the greatest mountains of all earth's creation. Why? Because that's the place where God himself gave to us the way of salvation. No wonder Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but by me. Let me ask you, and I'm done. When's the last time you've really thanked God for Calvary? Oh, Mount Hor, Mount Horeb, Mount Pisgah, Mount Arat, all of them, great mountains. But the one that surpasses them all. In God's mind, and even in mine, and should be in yours, is Mount Calvary. Thank you for listening. God bless you.